In this video for Module 4, we're going to talk a bit about exorcism. And remember now, this is ANTH 3315. Uh, it's not a theology class. It's not a religious studies class. It is, in fact, anthropology. So we're going to be discussing exorcism from uh, an objective, cross-cultural, uh, sort of pluralistic, uh, rational perspective. Exorcism, of course, presupposes the presence of a spirit. So we first need spirit possession before we can even begin speaking of exorcism. So exorcism presupposes spirit possession. And the idea behind exorcism is that we have an unwanted spirit, a negative intrusion of some sort. I say that because spirit possession is quite popular in traditional slash indigenous slash tribal religions, uh, such as the one I study, the Orisha religion in Trinidad, where possession is something that is actually desired. In fact, they beat drums, sing songs, say prayers, inviting the spirits to come down. So clearly, exorcism is not called for in those cases where the possessing spirit has been invited in. In case you're wondering, there are occasions where the invited spirit sort of overstays their welcome, but there are songs and prayers and things that can be done to quote-unquote uh, politely and civilly dismiss the spirit. But that's not really an exorcism. An exorcism involves a situation where we have a negative influence, a negative spirit that's inhabiting a person's body and it's clearly not wanted. In fact, it may even be doing harm to the individual. Okay, let's continue here by discussing exorcism in a Western context. In this country, we have something called deliverance ministries that are affiliated with, let's say, Pentecostal fundamentalist forms of Christian worship that actually attribute a variety of maladies to inhabiting spirits. So they speak of demons of adultery uh, and demons of murder uh, and etc. You know, demons of lust. And they claim to be able to heal a person of these issues or deliver them from these issues by expelling the demon that is the cause of this behavior. And in these so-called deliverance ministries, there will generally be one very charismatic individual who will oversee these exorcisms. Uh, there is an individual whose name is Bob Larson who has uh, gained a certain degree of notoriety and certainly popularity in fundamentalist circles, I guess you could say, for his ability to discern possession and also exorcise demons. In addition to deliverance ministries, of course, we have the Catholic Church, which has long been involved in exorcism. Uh, in fact, the so-called Ritual Romanum, Ritual Romanum, the Roman ritual, uh, dates back to 1614, and it has been a formal practice in the church since that time. In this Western or especially Catholic context, the exorcism itself involves basically six, six different stages. And this is how, for example, a demonologist in the church would describe it. First, there is the presence. In other words, uh, the exorcist and the people assisting the exorcist become aware that there is some sort of demonic presence. Then secondly there's the pretense and that's when the evil or possessing spirit actually tries to pass themselves off as the individual themselves. In other words they, they will actually mimic the individual and continue to hide at this point. Then there's the thirdly there's the break point and this is when the the pretense of the possessing entity just collapses and at that point the um, the evil spirit is 
exposed. And in fact, it may even begin speaking of the possessed individual in the third person. Fourthly, we have the voice. And here is where the voice of the demon becomes quite, quite clear. In other words, it's not the voice of the person, but it's something very strange, uh, very demonic, quote unquote. Next, we have the clash. And this is the time period during which the exorcist and his assistants are just in a direct battle with the demon, trying to make the demon reveal itself, reveal information, especially reveal its name. It's thought that once you can learn the demon's name, you can actually control it. And according to uh, the standard understanding of this business, standard church understanding, the evil spirit wants to stay right where it's at. It does not want to be banished to hell. And then finally, there's the expulsion. And this is when all of the efforts of the exorcist and his assistants come to fruition and culminate in the expulsion of the demon or the spirit. Now, what's interesting, I mentioned the ritual Romanum a while ago. Well, there were some changes made in 1952 to the ritual Romanum because at that point the church was becoming increasingly suspicious of claims of demonic possession. Uh, they were certainly beginning to err more on the side of modern psychology and modern psychiatry. So basically the changes in the ritual Romanum just made it more difficult to uh, obtain a diagnosis of demon possession. They're erring on the side of caution, basically. And today, in fact, it is very, very difficult to obtain a diagnosis of demonic possession from the church to uh, receive an official exorcism. It is the opinion of the church that, in fact, most of this aberrant psychological activity can be dealt with better through psychology and, and psychiatry. And that brings us to one of the issues regarding exorcism, as long as we're speaking anthropologically about this issue. You know, if you go back, I guess, probably about 500 years or earlier, virtually every form of anomalous or aberrant mental behavior, for example, Tourette's, schizophrenia, uh, epilepsy and other various uh, psychoses and neuroses were attributed to demonic possession and therefore all were subject to exorcism if not worse. Many were uh, condemned to die as being demon filled and it became quite clear as we reached the age of the enlightenment, the age of science and I'm talking the uh, 17th, 18th centuries it became clear that uh, there was such a thing as naturalistic mental disorders. In other words, relatively common disorders that could be, could be attributed to biochemical anomalies, uh, human physiology, uh, whatever the case may be. In other words, could be attributed to naturalistic causes, not supernaturalistic causes. And in fact, we reach today where at least in psychiatry and psychology, there's virtually not a single practicing psychiatrist or psychologist that embraces the diagnosis of, of spirit possession or demonic possession. Uh, that, that, for that, you have to go into the religious sphere. And it's, it's interesting to note that as we move closer to today, people have fewer and fewer reasons to invoke the diagnosis of demonic possession. Because, in fact, today we know about Tourette's. We know about schizophrenia. We know about epilepsy. And, in fact, we can treat these things quite successfully. And I think that is why there's virtually not a psychiatrist or a psychologist alive who would embrace a demonic possession uh, diagnosis for some sort of mental disability. And I think we need to keep this in mind as we look critically at this phenomenon. So that, that's one point we need to remember in regard to the anthropological analysis of this phenomenon. Uh, the fact that today 
we can explain virtually all mental disorders and treat them fairly successfully. Now we can't explain every single one, but it certainly appears as though we're getting closer and closer to the point where we will one day be able to successfully treat every single case. Certainly that is how it's trending. So there's that. Here's another issue that the anthropologist looks at and that is this. Oddly enough, given the fact that there are 10,500 different religions and probably just as many cultures out there and conceptions of God or gods and so forth, and each religion has its own exorcism ritual, but what's amazing is that exorcism always seems to work. It doesn't matter what the culture is, what the religion is, if there's one God or a thousand gods, uh, a, belli you know, a belligerent God, a, uh, a, a, a benevolent God, it doesn't really matter. It always seems to work, regardless of what the cultural or religious context is. Well, for the anthropologists, this is a pretty strong indication that we're not dealing with possession at all. In fact, what we're probably dealing with is some sort of healing because healing does take place. After all, I said exorcisms do work. But it's just that the healing is not considered to be therapeutic. In fact, it's considered to be psychotherapeutic. Therapeutic healing would be you have a virus, doctor gives you some sort of uh, medicine, and the medicine kills a virus, you get better. That's just your standard therapeutic healing. Psychotherapeutic healing involves a person uh, thinking that they're feeling better and in fact for that reason actually does feel better. Uh, consider the placebo effect. person has a, oh I don't know, let's say they have a knee joint pain and there's a doctor that they trust and they're given what's really uh, just a sugar pill, a placebo of some sort and they get better. The symptoms disappear. Uh, this is quite common. In fact it's so common there's a term for it, the placebo effect and it happens all the time. Nothing pharmacological was administered. Nothing biochemical happened. But yet some healing did take place. Well, that's sort of what we're talking about here in regard to psychotherapeutic healing. The individual, because of the enculturation, uh, in fact, that they have experienced, that's the process whereby people learn their culture, they have thoroughly embraced the spiritual and religious worldview into which they were born. Once possession occurs, of course, you have very, very important, highly visible members of their society that come together. Uh, priest, religious functionaries of various sorts and their assistants, and they're bringing all of the knowledge that culture has to bear on them. Uh, they've been singled out for very special treatment. There's a lot of confidence involved on both the part of the victim and the healer which is necessary, as I mentioned in another module. And it's not surprising that healing takes place because in regard to spirit possession, there apparently is nothing going on physiologically or biochemically or in fact naturally in any way, shape, or form. And at least that's why it seems like to me that healing is so easily accomplished and in fact is accomplished in virtually every single case and that's because there was nothing wrong with them to begin with other than suffering from an intense bout of enculturation which has left them with ideas regarding uh, possessing demons and and so forth okay well I've discussed exorcism in a Western context uh, in Kinsley chapter 7 you're going to read a bit about exorcism in northern India which will give you sort of a cross-cultural look at things. But generally speaking, regardless of the culture, the situation is roughly similar. There is thought to be an invading spirit, an unwanted spirit. Because of that, a person is exhibiting uh, strange behavior, maybe symptoms of sickness. And at that point, the religious functionaries are called in uh, with their holy books, if it's relevant, uh, and all of their paraphernalia and all of their assistants. Uh, a big fuss is made over the person and the person, not surprisingly, responds to the treatment. 
of course, as I said, every culture has its own treatment, and they also had their own conceptions of the possessing demons. So that's where it stands anthropologically. Anthropologists really don't put much stock in the spirit possession hypothesis as being the cause of these problems. For one thing, there's a much more elegant explanation, uh, and that is that the person is suffering from delusions, suggestion, what, whatever the case may be. Uh, certainly the way they suffer is directly related to their enculturation experiences. And that right there tells you that we're not dealing with something that's universal, but rather something cultural. And of course, in every case they're dealt with in a very cultural specific way based on their own beliefs. Remember there are 10,500 different religions out there. And as I said earlier, not surprisingly, in virtually all cases, they respond positively. They do receive some healing. They do receive from some relief. However, we can label that psychotherapeutic healing as opposed to therapeutic healing, as was explained earlier.